Hey, let's pray and then we're going to get, we're going to receive communion today. Father, we're grateful for your presence here today. Thank you, Father, we can come together in a place of worship where it's nice and cool. <laughs> so thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. And we appreciate uh, grace for them allowing us the opportunity to be here. Thank you. And we do lift up this ministry and thank you for blessing it to a greater degree in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for today we commit the service to you. It's in your hands. And so we trust you, Holy Spirit, to have free reign in Jesus name. Amen. amen. All right, guys, let's go to First Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. This is the first Sunday of the month. The traditional day that we receive communion. Not the scriptural, but although there's a, a premise to it, I, I think of the first day of the week, first day of the month, giving God first place. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, priority. All right, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. It says, For I received from the Lord that, that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading NIV, so I have to read. <laughs> I do have the King James memorized, but the NIV I don't have memorized. So. Mm -hmm. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is, which is for you. Oh, that's good. Which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new, test, new covenant in my blood. Do this. Do this. Whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Sorry, I'm, I'm butchering how it's the enunciations of it. So, so for, for verse 26, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So the two things we're doing is proclaiming salvation what we received and looking rem the reminder of the of the soon coming return of the lord and that's what this does what it says to us is that we have a reminder of the covenant that was established for us that we have a right when jesus comes to be caught up and that's good thank you jesus all right so then verse 27 so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So he basically, <laughs> unworthy manner is what the King James says, but here sinning against the body and blood of the Lord because of the, the idea of missing, missing the mark. You're missing the mark because you're not in covenant with God. So how can you remember somebody you never were introduced to? So you all know that we all in here know the Lord. So someone that doesn't in receiving communion it's, it has no meaning to it. So you're missing the mark on that. So you need Jesus first. Everyone ought to examine them, themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and, and a number of you have fallen asleep or die prematurely before the 80 years or the 120 years. Sorry, I take that back. Uh, but if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather together, gather together, when you gather to eat, you should eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further direction. So um, we're doing this mannerly and we're doing this in the, with the idea of as a body of Christ and remembering what Jesus did for us. So let's pray and then we'll receive communion. Father, thank you for what Jesus has done for us. He gave his life, and today we stand as whole healed individuals because of what Jesus did for us. Jesus, thank you for being willing to come into a physical body here in this earth realm, you being the Christ, the Son of God, living in a physical body named the Son of Man. And we know that you gave your blood, the blood of our Heavenly Father, 
that was in the form of this physical body where we can have this covenant, an everlasting covenant, pure of the sin of Adam and Eve. Right, Adam, thank you for the victory that we do have in you. Lord, as we do receive these elements, we receive them not knowing that we're not eating, literally eating flesh, the flesh of a human or drinking the blood of a human. We are doing this symbolically, knowing that we are in covenant with you as a remembrance the symbol of the bread and this grape juice. We thank you for it now that we are in this everlasting covenant. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So on the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And that's what we always do. We give thanks. Anytime we eat our, our foods, always give thanks, but our whatever food you eat. And then when we come together like this, we thank the Lord. So thank him and let's eat together. And in the same manner, he also took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant established in my blood. This do you as often as you do it in remembrance of him. So let's remember him as we drink together. And Lord, we are so grateful for your presence in our life. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for your love towards us. You're a wonderful father and we appreciate you, Lord. Thank you for your healing power that's present right now, moving in our midst, in our bodies, keeping us sound and strong. Thank you for providing, making ways for us where there seems to be no way. You are the one who provides, you are our source and we love you and we appreciate you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, you guys ready for the word? So here we go. So this is today I want to I want to title this fine tuning and it's still going to be with regards to faith. But there's a there's a principle that we need to derive from this idea, this concept that God has laid out for us regarding faith. And it has to be fine tuned. It must be fine tuned. It is it does not continue just automatically. Faith is something that must be continually used if you don't use it it becomes apathetic and it will not be uh, it will not be useful to you when it comes to the God kind of faith so uh, let's look at mark 11 mark actually let's go to Isaiah 59 I want to I want to touch on something that was it was the Lord because I, I was already thinking about this idea of a flood and then here comes mr. Jakes TD Jakes uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes, and he's talking about the floods of life and how these, how it impacts. And what I was, what I was correlating the flood with, because many times when we read this verse, we assume it to be the enemy that is coming in like a flood. But here's the thing, whether it's the enemy or whether it's God, floods always rid you of the trash. Do you understand? So whenever there's floods taking place and there's a flood coming, a floodgate of whatever it may be, something's going to manifest. Whatever's been stale, whatever's been sitting, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make itself known. We assume that the stuff that we harbor within our souls, the trash that we harbor within our souls, just goes away. And it doesn't just happen. There literally must take, what must take place is a is a cleansing which comes through the flood. So Isaiah 59, and I'm going to read King James, and you're going to see how the King James reads, and then I'm going to read uh, from the NIV, which I believe to be the more uh, accurate um, terminology for this, okay? So Isaiah 59, 19, and it reads, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. So it sounds like what's coming in like a flood when you read it from this translation. <laughs> it sounds like it's the enemy, right? So he says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. See that? Y'all see that? Y'all with me? 
give me some replies, guys. Let me know you're here. Okay, so I just want to make sure you're with me. So I want you to see how it reads, how the King James reads, okay? Now, if you have a, a phone, which most of us do, let's go to uh, the NIV of this, okay? You ready? And we're going to read it from verse number 19, okay? What did I, what did I say to read from verse 19? The one before? Okay, so I, th I believe that should have been... Um, yeah, that's right, that's right. So let's, let's read verse 19. So, from the west, people will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere His glory. For He will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. So do, do you see the difference, guys, mm -hmm. in, in comparing the two? And, the, and when we read it from the King James, it makes it sound like the enemy is the one who's bringing the flood. When you read it from the NIV, it's at, which is a more accurate, it is an accurate uh, translation of this, it's talking about God coming in as a flood. The Spirit of God coming in like a flood. And what happens when the flood comes in is it's going to push out stuff that th doesn't need to be there. And I mean, you would take that example of taking a, a water cup and if you put dirt inside of the cup and then you put the cup under the water spigot and you start filling it up, eventually that, all that dirt's gonna come out of that cup, right? So as it were, your, our minds can have some things in it that need to get pushed out, need to get out. And it's the reason why we have to hone in on what God says. See, the mind was created to be planted with God's Word. It was created for that purpose. And if we're not instilling His Word in us, and what I mean by this is that on a continuous basis, and you think about how Psalms chapter 1 refers to being planted by the, a tree, planted by the rivers of water. You're getting something on a, on a continuous flow. When you stop that halt, you subject yourself to a flow of the enemy. This is where the enemy comes in and starts lying to your mind and we start believing lies that places us in a compromising position. And what happens is we, we forfeit our values because now our value system is not based on what God says, it's based on what's being infiltrated. Remember Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, out of the abundance of what? And that has to do with the abundance of what? The mind. When you think about the heart, everybody, everybody point to your heart. This is your heart right here. So whatever you have going on in abundance is what's going to come out of you. And remember, your mind is a neutral part of you. It doesn't care what you put inside of it. Whatever you put in it is what it's going to produce. So you have to, you have, to have the right formula. And here, here, are, here are some of the things that we have to put into our hearts and our minds. Processes and strategies. Because if we don't have it, it won't change. It'll stay the same. Something else will come in and take, take place. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right. And this is what happens. You start to lie to yourself and you start to accept that that's what it is. You believe your own lies. And what do you call that? Bottom line is deception. You know, it's one thing to be lied to. It's another thing to lie to yourself. <laughs> and live in that. And that is, that is a worse condition. Because now, now here's, here's the probability with that. You are now subject to the lies that come along in life. And remember, Satan is a father of lies. Remember, he's, and think about the word father. Father means what? The word father means what? Source. Right? So, Satan is the, is the source of lies. There is no lie in God. If there was a lie in God, then this whole universe, everything that exists would disintegrate. Because then now God is not true to his word. And of all the things that Jesus said to do is to be ye perfect even as your father, which means be a person of your word. You say it, do it, be it. Right? 
and it matters. And if you don't do that, what happens is you start deteriorating your own value system. And how do you see yourself when you start to inject in your mind that I, <laughs> I am okay with the compromises of life and that it's okay to do whatever, whatever, and you accept that, you start to degrade and demean yourself and you allow for others to take advantage of you. And so here's the thing, Numbers 13 says that they beheld themselves as grasshoppers. They thought of themselves as being as small as grasshoppers in the sight of the enemies. And because they felt that way about themselves, they saw themselves that way, they were treated as such. If you don't like the way you're being treated, then you need to change the way you think about yourself. You cannot, I'll tell you, you cannot expect for someone else to change, for you to enjoy that relationship. We're waiting for other people to change. <laughs> you're gonna be waiting till you're blue in the face before you ever increase in that relationship, if that relationship is of any value to you. If I'm, if I'm expecting, I have an expectation of you as individuals, and I'm expecting for you to be at a different place in your life. You should be at a def definite different spiritual level in your life. And you're not. What happens? Frustration. Disappointment. Hatred. Anger. I, I, I've, I've heard pastors <laughs> say, I just don't, I don't, they're not pastoring no more. Says, I don't pastor no more because I just don't like the way people don't like what I do and what I say. Well, then obviously pastoring is not the thing for you because what comes along with pastoring is criticism. I hear you, pastor. Are you doing the same thing? Are you still fat? <laughs> you, you, know, you know, we go through these things mentally, right? There's a lot of things that transpire in a church, in an, in an environment, in a, in a parishioner-pastor relationship. But I cannot expect for you to be where you're supposed to be. That is definitely an individual responsibility. My responsibility is to give you the word and the process by which you do so. And to give you the strategies on how to accomplish it. That's my responsibility to you. It's not that I don't care about you. I lift you up in my prayers. You are prayed for, just know that, and you are prayed for daily. There may be times that I sense and feel, but it's still not my responsibility to be, have you in my pocket to make sure you live right. Yeah. It's not my job, I'd be, I'd be going crazy. Following you all around. Checking everything you do and how you say things. No, no, no. That's up to you. Think about it. He never leaves us and he never forsakes us and you still are not changing. Not you, but how people can be. <laughs> oh boy, hallelujah. Okay. So the flood aspects of life will come. And here's the one thing that Mr. Jake stated, Bishop Jake stated that when you're in the flood, you need to stand. And a lot of times you feel it's, it's like everything's being washed away. And I, 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 I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with the phrase because things are being washed and you still are standing. You may even be sinking in, in, the, in the mud and that you may be going stuck in that, but you're standing. In spite of, in spite of the criticism, in spite of the negative, in spite of whatever it may be, the circumstances that want to dictate to you where you're going in life. You're standing. So here's the thing, guys. Do not allow circumstances to govern you. Create your own circumstances. Don't let the enemy come in and paint the picture for you. Paint your own picture. 
Let God's word be what generates this increase in your life because that is what's going to cause the change. That is what's going to build you up. That is what's going to cause you to become a believer and not a doubter. You will fight because you're motivated. Leaders are self-motivated. I don't need to have somebody to motivate me to do what I do. If anything, the devil wants to bust my bubble, as it were. He wants me to get out of the pocket. You know that there's a, I mean, I, I, I played football a little bit, not a whole lot, but I know that the quarterback, you know, they, they set up this, they have the whole defensive line, that whole, that uh, offensive line, and they're there to create this whole plan is to create a pocket for the play. If they protect the quarterback and the quarterback stays in the pocket, that means that surrounding environment that that play demands, he'll be able to run the play. He'll be able to get the ball to the person that it's intended to. But if you get out of the pocket, sometimes you got some of these enemies, the defensive line, they come in rushing in, they throw a blitz on you, or they're all rushing in on you, and you're gonna have to know how to function in the pocket. And I know you ladies have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but in the game of football, there's, there's, there is that plan that you have to stay to, that strategy in order to get the ball across that goal line. But if you come out of that pocket, you make yourself vulnerable. You either got to run hard or you're going to take a hit. One or the other. We got to stay in the pocket, guys. Stay in your lane. You're running a track race, you got to stay in your lane or you become disqualified. And what happens is the enemy wants to come in like that flood, the way the Spirit of the Lord come in, comes in like a flood. He's coming in. The Spirit of the Lord is coming in for the wind of change. But so likewise, in the midst of this change, there's this other wind that wants to come in and side, sideswipe you. Uh, you know, I, I uh, in the few times that I play football and I play, and these guys, because, I, you know, I don't know if I just draw this to myself or what. I, it is because I draw it to myself. I, I do have that, de that demeanor that I can do something. I got that look, that face. And I have that drive, like they even said it, and we were playing a, a game, and they said, uh, and they, Pastor Burns, just, you know, we're just playing, and we're not doing, like, really. I said, okay, okay. But they set me up. They set me up, the linemen, they did it on purpose. Why did they do me? They could have set up anybody else, because they knew my strength. And so this guy comes at me, and here comes this other guy, sideswipe me. Boom, threw me off and I couldn't, it was hard for me to get in to get the quarterback. I was rushing. You gotta watch those side swipes. <laughs> and in life, you're gonna be faced with a lot of side swipes. Things that come up. And some of us may be facing financial side swipes. Relational ones, whatever it may be. You just got to be prepared for it. And this is why you have to hone in on what God says to you. That flood that wants to come in and move you out of the pocket. But what happens? You get fixated on a specific thing and you don't know how to be flexible in the midst of a, of a battle. That's what happens. You get fixated. Let, let's, let's look at this. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and, and I believe we were on this last week. Were, were we not? Yes, we were. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we were reading verse number 13, but today we're going to read verse number 18, okay? But I want to read it from the uh, uh, NIV, okay? And it's okay to talk to me because, you know, we got... Yeah, you can talk to me. Just say, okay, Pastor, got you. Okay. 
Okay, so let's let's read it from let's read it from verse 16. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Remember the attitude of faith. The attitude of faith. And believe me. Have, look up, look up at me, you guys, all of y'all. You ever had an attitude? Yes. What comes along with that attitude? Angst. How do I know the attitude? How do I know your attitude? What you say? What you exactly. Yeah. What your words are. Oh, yeah. yeah, you're going to tell me something, whether you're fa you ever seen like, mm -hmm. somebody makes a comment and you make like, rolling the eyes, and, does that say something? Yeah. Sure does, right? <laughs> Okay, so what's the attitude of faith? Yeah, Here, think about it. The attitude of faith, here's the thing about the attitude of faith. It appears that nothing moves you. The, atti the attitude of faith is like who God is. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes, right? He never changes. We're supposed to be like God. We are a work in progress, so I'm not, you know, okay, I, okay, there's your scapegoat. All right, so you can get, you find your, you want to go the wimpy way, by all means, go the wimpy way. But get out of the wimp, and let's start manning up and womaning up. God says, Jesus said, and I'm, I'm keep reiter reiterating that Matthew 5 48 be ye perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect what is that that is consistency he never changes yeah. he's the same never changes his word never changes he never changes towards us he's always the same right mm -hmm. so faith keeps you consistent faith is intended to keep you strong in the midst of weakness. And I'm talking about an emotional weakness. Have you ever been emotionally weak? And what happens? You're going to start verbalizing. I, I, you know, I play these stupid games, and then sometimes it's, and I'm playing with a group of 100, 128 guys now on the screen. So, you know, you, you expect, you have, a, you have a squad that you work with, it's a military kind of game. So you have a squad, four guys that you're working with. And you're, and you're you know, what happens, <laughs> we get in the game and everybody goes their own way. Do you know it doesn't work? You'll last for a little bit, but you end up getting killed or taken out. What's the objectives? You have some goals and some destinations and some objectives that you're pressing towards. And I'm talking now from a, in a game, but in the, in the game of life, you have some objectives and some directives from God, some standards that you live by and some precepts that you're pressing towards that you're using to fight to get to an objective, to accomplish something, to do something, right? But when you're not working together, when you're not one, what happens? You get torn. You get pulled apart. Double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. How do you expect to stay strong and you're twisted up in your head? How, do, how, how, how does that happen? Does that, does that work? You ever been mentally molested? Now, you're not going to admit that, but there are many people who have been torn apart mentally and as a result, they're unstable on how they function in life. It happens. So we, we, gotta, we must have a standard to live by. And that is the Word of God. And if we don't allow for the Word to be the standard for our decision making, we'll end up becoming fickle as individuals, indecisive, complacent, irresponsible, all the other things. You're talking, you're talking we put our efforts in, in things that, that we assume are free to us. Somebody is paying for something. There are no free lunches, guys. Somebody paid for that lunch. 
<laughs> so you're going to have to develop this process that God has established for us called faith. And if you don't do it, you're going to go along with the river, with the flood. What happens with the flood? Have you, you ever seen the, 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 uh, the unfortunate uh, depiction of the tsunami that happened, that movie? You know, you've seen the movie how they showed that and how the, what, the oceans, the earth dropped and the ocean that caused that tsunami to happen <laughs> and wiped out that whole area, sunk it into the ground. Are you ready for the tsunami that's, that's about to happen? Do you think you're going through it now? And that's not doing a doom gloom kind of message. I'm encouraging you that when you're in the Lord and you're in that strength that no tsunami could, to, can wipe you out. If God be for us, who can be against us? Y'all with me? We stay encouraged in the Lord. We encourage ourselves in the Lord. We stay in the word. Let the word have the final say in our lives. That's the rock that does not roll. <laughs> All right. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 16. And look at the phrase, the first phrase of that verse in verse number 16. Do not lose heart. Don't lose your mind, guys. Don't allow yourself to get into that place of, of apathy. Though, our out, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Verse 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And I like this next verse here and how it reads. In the original King James it says, so though we uh, uh, do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So that's the original King James, right? right? This NIV reads this way. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen. And most of the time, the circumstances that we govern or allow ourselves to be governed by is dictating how we make our decisions for our lives. Where are you in your faith? Where are you with when the circumstance is contrary to you? Where do you go to? And usually you go to what you emotionally are attached to. Seems like a natural inclination. So let's say this. If you have a love relationship with the Lord, when the circumstances are contrary to you, who will you go to? Whoever you're emotionally attached to. Right? That would be the normal. You would go right to that. That's like your norm. Not to the immediate defeatist mindset and just allowing for whatever to come and subvert your thinking and control your arena of life. You should be able to stand and fight and resist the things that come your way because they're going to come. If, if you want to make a, a difference, if you want to change, if you want to better you, you're going to have to go through some purging, some floods. It does not just happen, guys. <laughs> so he says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. What is the unseen thing? We're talking now about the gifts and talents God has blessed you with. What all the things that are of great value that we minimize its value have been given to us freely. We minimize our its value. There is uh, intellectual property. You ever heard of that? That people pay millions for. Billions. Or billionaires as a result of intellectual property. What is intellectual property? A movie. A software. A process, a book, intellectual property. P 
People are willing to pay you for what you know. They're willing to pay you. I don't, you know, I need, I need this working. I need it fixed. And I'm willing to pay you for it to work. How much are you worth? And what you're worth is not based on what you have. What you're worth, now I'm talking about physically, material stuff. You, what you're worth is based on what you have in you. You, you, you understand? So let's, 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 okay. So, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary. Because once a manifestation of something takes place, does that end? I mean, that, as far as that's concerned, it's going to be used a chair, is a chair, and however it's made, it's still a chair. <laughs> a chair is a chair. And people have the benefits of the chairs from one person's intellectual property. It was created. Right? It was, it, was, it was discovered and it was made as a result. So we have all these different things and it's not the end all, guys. There are other chairs being made. There are other uh, jack-in-the-boxes, McDonald's, Habits, uh, whatever. Uber Eats, other Grubhubs. <laughs> There's other venues, things that we, we never thought of that are being used in our day to day, intellectual property that is allowing for people to live and to have this uh, a retroactive involvement creating productivity. People are be being able to be provided for and cared for and at the same time, the individuals that are engaged in it, what are they doing? They're allowing their life to be generated. There's something about giving, sowing, right? It's, it generates life. It's nice to give. It is nice to give. I, I think it's nice to give. Would you agree with me on that? Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, faith is never altered. Faith never betrays. Faith never changes. Faith is consistent. Faith is fluid. Faith keeps you balanced. Faith works. Faith works. So now, um, oh, let me go here. I'm sorry. I need to go here. Okay, sorry. Okay, so faith is released once you have the clarity of where you're going. So question for you is where does faith come from? Give me an answer, guys. From God. But once you have it from God, where does it come from? You're all saved, right? You're all saved? Okay, born of the Spirit of God. So we know Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? Okay, so where does it come from? From within you, your spirit. Because who were you born from? God. Who created you? God. So are there differences with faith? Because the person that is a staunch atheist, evolutionist, person does not believe, but yet are, they are doing something. Are they not using faith? Because faith without works is what? Is dead. Right? They're still using faith. But what's the difference, guys? Uh, uh, um, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And this, I'm going to read it to you from, uh, let's see what the, uh, oops, not that, from the NIV. <laughs> chapter 3. And verse number two. And I think, let's see here. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay, verse number two says, I pray that we may be delivered from the wicked and, and evil people, for not everyone has faith. What is it? How does the New King James read? 
not everyone has faith. I think that's how it reads, right? NIV. How does the original King James read? You guys have your your Bibles? What? Okay. Second Thessalonians three two. That then I get I'll get it for you. Never mind. I'll bring it up. You're taking too long. Okay. For all men have not faith. That's what it says. Okay. I thought we all have faith. Don't we all have faith? But not all men have faith based on this, right? What is he saying? Not all men have the God kind of faith. What determines God kind as opposed to what is the other faith? Sense knowledge faith. Is there anything wrong with sense knowledge faith? Nothing wrong with it. That's why people still gloat in what they do. They boast in the fact that I have my hands and this is what I do and I create my own money. I create my own well-being. Really? Let's pull it all away from you. Take the earth out of here, everything, and now make it. Make your own earth, your own dirt, your own stuff. You do it. Will that happen? <laughs> no. We're subject to the source, God. So the difference between those that have the God kind of faith and those that use sense knowledge faith, in and of themselves, they are their own God. That's basically what they're saying. I, su I supply, I'm my, I am my own source, right? We say God is our source. And how do we determine that? How do we determine that? By his word. That is what is drawn on every time we hear the word of God. When we hear the word, it's drawing on what we have already in us. And what is that? Faith. You were born of God, created by God, and you're supposed to do something. Right? So, so let's go to James. So just to clarify that the verse says not all men have faith. Not everyone has faith. Not everyone has the God kind of faith. And that's where the pride comes in. Because you're saying you are your own source. Like what Lucifer said before he became Satan. So if you're saying that you are your own source, then you are acting like your father, the devil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hallelujah. But we as believers, we what? We choose to acknowledge God, that God is our source. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge God. Yeah. I acknowledge Him in what I do. Yeah. He is my source. I do not live in and of myself. Mm -hmm. The things that I do in life, I do because He equips me to do it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. All right, so James chapter 1 and verse number 19. And it reads, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man wor worketh not the righteousness of God. I'm reading King James now. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the, look at the word, look at, what does it say there? It says what? Are you guys, you guys are reading with me? Uh, that was a regular King James. Okay, what does your Bible say? Uh, verse, and receive with meekness, uh, verse 21, 21, yeah. So therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil, this is NIV now, and the evil that is 21, that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you. See that? Engrafted is what King J, old English term, says current English says planted it's already in you so how many of you realize and I know you know this you guys are smart people that a seed will not grow without being watered it has to be watered faith comes the growth comes when you water it not every not all of us we the way God 
made us. He did not equip you, a specific person, uh, you with just like maybe a, an eighth of faith and then uh, you with, with a quarter of faith and you with a half, half gallon of faith and you with a gallon. He didn't do that. He gave us all the same measure. But it appears that others have more faith than others. Doesn't it appear that way sometimes? It looks that way. But the fact is, is that others have decided to use it more than others. Why, why is my muscle more firm than others and others more firm than mine? Because they've got the same muscle same bicep but why is mine a little squishy <laughs> compared to others that is a little more firm why because they exercise it they use it they develop it they grow it right and they have to go through some pain to get it there you get you have to go through some some suffering some sacrifice if you want to have a rip, ripped abs, you're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to get rid of the, the additions that we put on us through the channel of food. And you're going to have to put out more work than you put in food-wise for you to get to that place. I, I, I know, I've, I've been there before. I haven't visited for a little bit, but I've been there. I know what it looks like. I do have some muscles, like right up here, you can see them. When you go a little lower, it's sort of like it flares out. <laughs> but can they be changed? Yeah. I saw the 69-year-old, I mean, Pam showed me this, what, was she 84 or something like that? And she was ripped. Ripped. Saw the 69-year-old man, he was like sideways on, on a pole, his legs out, holding himself up. <laughs> There's, they're really, and now whether they know the Lord or not, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is that they applied themselves to something to get themselves to that place at a later time in their life. Because the assumption is that once you get to a certain age, that's it. I understand that there are different things that happen in the body that you're, as you, as the body ages, that you have to be aware of. I understand that. But can it be to its optimum as you age? Yes. Can we not slow the aging process down? When I saw uh, Mr. Copeland doing push-ups like this, because you want thing to do a push-up like this, right? Like this. But to do it this way, you're using triceps a lot of different it's a little different workout a little harder harder to do 84 years of age and he did 20 of them boom 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 that's like <laughs> <laughs> no excuses guys so we have people that we can admire we're not going to limit we're not going to limit ourselves because we say that there's just no way. It's just not happening. Full mobility. Full mobility. I, I, I speak full mobility to you. And you have, to, you, have, now you have to apply yourself for full mobility. For a greater work. Right? So when he says, therefore get rid of all the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. And, it, and it, ref, it refers to the saving of the soul in the original King James. Doesn't he not? Doesn't he say that? Yeah. For the saving of the soul? Mm -hmm. yes. The implanted word that saves your soul. Because the soul needs to be saved. Yeah. The spirit is saved because of Jesus. But the soul needs to be saved because of you. Mm -hmm. 
We'll read, we'll read uh, Romans chapter 12. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Let's read Romans chapter 12. Hallelujah. You guys are flowing with me so far? Um, Romans chapter 12, and then and let's look at some of the things. Here's, here's, the, here's the deprivation in the, in the body and when it comes to individuals that the majority of believers are conformers, which and another term with that, that would be followers. The majority of believers follow compromise more than lead righteousness. They feed the, the negative more than they lead the uprightness. The pressure of what comes along in life, because you know the standards of the world, are based on lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Right? So that, that protection for negativity is, is very, very powerful. Powerful enough to make who you are as the light, darkness. If the light be in you, I mean, if the darkness be in you, how great is that darkness? Because you are children of the light. But yet you're living like darkness. Why? How can that happen? It's really simple. You just stop putting the light in. You stop watering the seed. You stop feeding what you know like what we're reading here, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. And look at what he says to do. And humble yourselves. Yield to God. Yield to what is right. But what, what do we do? We yield to what? What is, not you, but some people. Yield to what is wrong. And then what do you have to deal with? Oppression, depression, shame, guilt, all this stuff. We were, sin was never supposed to be a part of the, the norm. That's not natural. It is not natural to live in sin. It's unnatural. That's why it's uncomfortable. You feel bad until you sear your conscience to it. Then you are professional fronters. You become good actors. Really good. Because you desire something that's contrary to what God says. So how do you live? In a lie. But nobody here. Praise the Lord. Okay. Now, where are we at? Verse 21. Oh, we're going to say Romans 12, right? Okay, yeah, let's go to Romans 12. And we'll stop with this, guys, because this, this is getting pretty heavy. <laughs> okay, verse number two, Romans 12, two. He says, do not conform to the, this is NIV, to the pattern of this world. The pattern, process, strategy. The pattern of the world be, ends up becoming a habit. The habit ends up becoming a character, and the character ends up becoming your destination. How it, that's how it works. Whether you, it's all the same. We're, there's no, there's nothing, nothing new under the sun, guys. We all have the same stuff we got to deal with. You all have a mind. You have a body. You have a spirit. You a spirit being? Yes. We got the same stuff, man. And we had all the tools, the strategies, the processes, everything for us to be able to do what is honorable to God, what is integral, not lying not cheating, not deceiving yourself. Forget somebody else. You, you gotta, you gotta lie to you, believe your own lie first before you can lie to someone else. <laughs> right? But you fight that, you resist that, and you get out of the habit of it. Because it can become a habit. And it ends up becoming a characteristic. And you don't want to be viewed upon as a, as a child of the devil. Any children of the devil in here? No. <laughs> if you're lying, you're acting just like your daddy. <laughs> 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 
So do not conform to the pattern of this world. Remember who's behind the world system? Satan, Satan is. The God of this world, he blinds the minds. He says, but, but be transformed by what? Renewing your mind, guys. Conforming has to do with following the follower. They've been going on and on and on in the same mess. Following defeated people. That's not the way to live. We conform to the patterns of the Word of God. God, is Jesus the winner? Is He the victorious one? Where is He seated? At the right hand of the Father. Did He not win for us? So we're in Jesus. And if we're in Jesus, then we're winners too. You just got to let your mind know it. You're the winner. You're not the loser. Winner? No losers. <laughs> okay, be, uh, by the renewal of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, ple pleasing, and perfect will. Because God is good. God, God is so good. God is a good Father. God is for you. He's not against you. God desires for you to be elevated and lifted up, not put down. That's why faith always keeps you up. Faith keeps you in that up position. So we're equipped to live a good life of victory, life of faith. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. What is it? Even our faith. Faith wins. Praise the Lord. Okay, guys, we're going to stop there. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. If you're going to be giving into our ministry, please do so through the channel Venmo. You're giving to Faith Wired. And we do appreciate your faithfulness and commitment to our ministry. We trust that this ministry is teaching you the word and giving you what you need in order to accomplish what you need in life. It's not about just coming to church and doing business as usual. It's about coming to church or hearing the word and making a difference, right? I want to make a difference however I can, wherever I can. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's pray and we'll conclude in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your presence in our life. Thank you for speaking a word to us. We trust and believe that as the word has gone forth, that it has blessed the ears of those, the, the, the lives of those that have been willing to hear. So we thank you for the victory that we do have in you in, in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Don't forget on YouTube that you like, subscribe, and be a part of. We appreciate it. All right, be blessed.